industry and peaceful application of nuclear technology in relation to the 10th MPT review conference. Um, my name is Marjolein van Delen. Uh, I'm your moderator today and I'm also the designated chair of uh, main committee three. But first of all, some household uh, remarks. Um, I'd like to ask all participants to mute their microphones uh, and to disable their cameras, um, except for the, for the speakers and the panelists. Um, I'd like to inform you that the meeting is uh, on the record uh, and also that we'll be recording it. Um, so it's, it's good to, to realize that. Um, the format of the meeting is such that now, um, first of all, uh, um, Izumi Nakamitsu and the Secretary General will deliver some opening remarks, uh, followed by a keynote address by Mr. Sharkat Abdurazak uh, of the IAEA. And that will be followed by um, a panel of four very distinguished panelists. We have uh, Mr. Charles Oko, um, who's counselor in the Nigerian permanent mission in Vienna. We, are, ha we have Dr. Sama Bilbao in Lyon, DG at the World Nuclear Association Organization. Sorry. Mr. Sajis Babu, a chairperson of the International Committee for Non-Destructive Testing. And Ms. Nicole uh, Danjoy, or Danjoy, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, this vice chair of the Global Diagnostic Imaging Healthcare IT and Radiation Therapy um, Association. After that, President Designate Gustavo Gleslauvinen uh, will deliver some remarks. And then we'll open the floor for, for questions and answers. Um, so with that, I'd just like to say a few words on, on this, this webinar, what, what it's about. Um, after the, the review conference of the MPT had to be postponed um, uh, last year due to the pandemic, um, it, it was, uh, I think, of interest of many to stay engaged uh, on the topics of the of the MPT and especially to stay engaged uh, with those outside of the group of member states uh, of the MPT. So especially with industry, with other organizations, international organizations, with civil society. So to that effect, UNODA has organized a series of webinars um, and today's one is on our engagement with industry. It's been uh, organized in cooperation between the IAEA and uh, UNODA. So I would like to thank both of them for organizing. And I think um, with that, with that setting, um, I'd like to get us started without much further ado. And first, I'd like to ask uh, Izumi Nakamitsu, her Under Secretary General uh, for Disarmament Affairs, to deliver some opening remarks. Um, Izumi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Myelin. So nice to see you. Ambassador Van Dielen, Myelin, Ambassador Zlovnen, Gustavo, Gors, Mr. Abdul Razak, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to join you today. At the outset, I would like to thank the International Atomic Energy Agency for partnering with us to produce this event. But more broadly, I also want to thank the IAEA for its continued collaboration in supporting the MPT review process, especially in keeping up momentum during this period of uncertainty. uncertainty. <clears throat> This webinar is a proactive example of what Secretary General calls inclusive multilateralism, that is looking outside the traditional parameters, if you will, of the international community to embrace new and different stakeholders. It reflects a growing understanding of the need for so-called multi-stakeholder forums. These forums brings together um, diverse groups of actors to engage in dialogue, provide fresh and different perspectives, and of course generate innovative solutions to pressing problems. They allow us also to 
cross-pollinate different forms. It is becoming increasingly apparent that in today's context of uh, historic advances in science and technology, the um, progenitors of that uh, technology need to be in the room when discussing its application, ramifications and regulation. While the development of nuclear energy was initially a state-led endeavor, the cutting-edge breakthroughs in areas such as power generation, human and animal health, water conservation and agriculture are being driven by innovations from the private sector. It is therefore important that we hear from industry how it believes it can help facilitate better implementation of the MPT. Given the nature of the expertise on our panel, I am sure that we will hear about how the nuclear industry is helping to improve the conditions for many of the most vulnerable populations around the world. Pillar three of the MPT, which provides for access to and facilitation of the peaceful uses of nuclear technology, is often overlooked, but it is an integral element of the MPT's success. Industry can play a central role in building on that success. The intersection between international peace and security and sustainable development is becoming increasingly recognized. This is especially the case as more and more states promote a human-centered approach to security. The MPT is uniquely situated at the crossroads between security development and technological advancement. The review conference, therefore, presents an invaluable opportunity to strengthen states' parties' contribution to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Industry can and should play an important role in realizing such an outcome, not least by identifying areas in which they can support and add value to the excellent work being done by the IAEA in facilitating technical assistance regional outreach and educational programs. However, I would also like to use this opportunity to point out that the private sector's contribution to the MPT can go beyond peaceful uses. Industry can play a role in supporting pillars one and two as well. Technological advances developed for civilian uses can have important applications for non-proliferation and disarmament. Take, for example, the possible applications of distributed leisure technologies such as blockchain for safeguards information management. All the, the role that imagine uh, image recognition software or remote sensing technologies can play in verification of compliance. We need to sharpen our tools to prevent proliferation and take steps towards a world free of nuclear weapons in the face of mounting technological challenges. Industry can provide important assistance in this regard, I believe, but we need to engage them and involve them in our conversations. So I look forward to hearing what our panelists and the audience have to say on these topics during the Q&A segment and I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward back to you, Mayolin. Thank you very much, Izumi, for setting us off on the right foot and for reminding us um, the, the important link between peaceful uses to the SDGs, um, as well as to uh, the first and second pillar of the MPT. And with that, uh, I think that's a good segue to um, our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Sharkat Abdurazak of the IAEA. He is the director of the Division for Africa in the Department of Technical Cooperation. Um, Mr. Abdurazak, uh, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And also, let me take the opportunity to recognize the presence of Her Excellency uh, Nakamitsu, uh, fellows, uh, panelists who are here, and all participants. Um, excellencies, uh, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to share with you my slides. Can you, uh, Ambassador Dillon, are you able to see my slides? Yes, yes, I see them. Okay. Um, excellencies, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed uh, a great uh, honor to address this important uh, webinar. Uh, webinar. Uh, in run up to the 10th NPT review conference on the topic of the third pillar of the treaty, the peaceful uses uh, of nuclear energy. Uh, the IAEA uh, plays uh, a dual role in meeting the objective of the NPT. Uh, it is uh, entrusted with the key verification responsibilities under the treaty, and it also has an important role in supporting achievement of the objective under Article 4 to foster international cooperation in the peaceful uh, uses of nuclear energy. We welcome that the discussion aims to reflect the equal uh, footing of all three pillars of the treaty. You recall that these are the non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful uses by highlighting the importance of nuclear application in achieving development goals. This indeed, the aspect of NPT, we notice most progress. I would like to uh, commend the topic uh, selected for this uh, webinar, the link between the industry and the peaceful applications of nuclear uh, technology. We can see from these figures how important the contribution of industry is to the GDP per capita in each region. But this, of course, uh, contribution is uneven. You can see from the slide, Africa faces a significant gap. Uh, Industry-generated GDP in Africa is less than a third of that in Latin America and less than a fifth of uh, East Asia. So in, in fact, Africa then needs to leapfrog to catch up on this, uh, on this aspect. Nuclear technique and technologies contribute directly to nine uh, out of the 17 SDGs, they address fields as diverse as food production, diagnosis of disease and management of natural resources, and several nuclear applications make key contribution to industry. And you can see from the slide, I have provided some few examples of uh, how nuclear technology would be able to contribute in different, uh, you know, SDGs, the, the, the nine SDGs that I've mentioned, and you can see the thematic areas that we focus on uh, here at the IAEA. You can see that contribution clearly here that uh, nuclear applications are widely applied in oil and gas uh, sector. They are also used to ensure safety in power plants and the aviation industry. Uh, nuclear science and technology is essential for imaging and radiotherapy equipment. And still in the health industry, nuclear technology is indispensable for medical isotope and radiopharmaceutical production. Radiation processing plays a huge role in industry today, including in food safety industry, et cetera, et cetera. Just to give you an example, the size of such a market is huge in the global economy. For example, according to the Fortune Business Insight, nuclear medicine or radiopharmaceutical industry had a market size of almost $5 billion in 2018, while the global imaging equipment market mounted to more than $36 billion in 2019. These are very impressive figures, and I'm sure my, my colleagues, the panelists, are going to shed more light on this uh, aspect. To strengthen and support the links between the industry and peaceful application of nuclear energy, our DG, the IAD uh, uh, Director General Rafael Grossi, signed a practical uh, agreement with UNIDO Director General Lee Young, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, in June 2020. This agreement aimed to enhance the integration 
of the peaceful uses of nuclear technology implementation of industrial development projects in member states, common to both organizations. Several areas have been identified where nuclear science and technology can be integrated into implementation of industrial development projects in member states. And these are indicated on my slides. They include food and agriculture, water and environment, uh, climate change mitigation, energy planning, waste management, uh, decommissioning and environmental radiation remediation and the rest are also indicated on the slide on the slide there. The IAEA has been for many years now helping uh, countries to establish national non-destructive testing or if you like the NDT capacities using nuclear technology for many years. The agency promotes the use of NDT technology to maintain high standards of quality control for the safe operations of nuclear and industrial installations. In numerous countries, this has led to establishment of national teams that provide services to industries. IEA support has also assisted in development of NDT training centers and certification systems. Let me give you some few examples. Because of time, uh, moderator, I'm just going to provide three examples. Let me start with Malaysia. In Malaysia, companies in the oil and gas sector account for around 70% of all NDT inspection businesses. The IAEA has helped the country to establish an internationally recognized NDT training, qualification and certification scheme, which has improved industrial competitiveness in that country. The cost of the local inspection is more is about uh, one fifth of cost of hiring inspectors uh, from overseas. So you can see our contribution here in trying to build capacity and capability and be able to make good use of the local resources in in that country. Second example that I would like to share with you: the Albanian researchers are using nuclear technology in research into into and conservation of cultural heritage. The, the use of x-rays helped Albania understand the painting history of a delicate centuries-old masterpiece of St. George. If I move to Africa, in Morocco, almost a decade now, specialists in Morocco are using their NDT experience to support countries throughout Africa in using NDT sealed radioactive sources and radioactive traces. And this is one of examples of what we normally call here the triangular or TDC, uh, TCDC approach that countries which are relatively more advanced would be able to mentor and help countries which are coming up in particular fields. Ladies and gentlemen, just a few days ago, more than 40 world leaders gathered for climate change summit to celebrate Earth Day. They highlighted once again the pressing global challenge that face our planet, the climate change. Nuclear power has a great deal to contribute in responding to this global emergency. Nuclear power is an essential part of clean and resilient, reliable and sustainable energy systems. Just to give you some few figures on the slides, more than 440 power reactors operate around the world today. They produce more than 11% of the world electricity. This accounts for around one third of all low carbon electricity. In addition, 153 countries and 20 international organizations use IAEA energy planning tools that are designed to help countries identify their energy needs and ways to meet them. Nuclear power program contributes to SDG number seven which is affordable and clean energy, SDG number nine, which is industry, innovation and infrastructure, and number 13, which is the climate action. This is a very important slide, and I would like to take a little bit of time here that um, we welcome uh, to uh, the crucial question of how can the industry widen and sustain the knowledge and technology transferred by the IAE in developing countries. The IAEA plays a key role in building national capacities and capability in nuclear science and technology. 
It provides a demand-driven assistance that responds to each country's needs and priority. In all different sectors that I have just mentioned before this slide, industry can play a key role in broadening and sustaining the knowledge and technology transferred by the IAEA in developing countries. It plays an important role uh, as a role, as a multiplier, if you like, of IEA transfer of technology to its member states. It goes actually beyond the NDT and applies a cross board. And a crucial point, the industry supports the uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. I think this is very important that we need to build capacity and capability, and we see how industry could be able the, to play this role in actually supporting some of educational and training uh, ventures that we might be having in developing countries. Government need to ensure that the nuclear technology and know how they acquire is marketable and relevant for needs of end users. The IAEA supports capacity building, but action is needed to bridge the gap between the needs of the industry and the technical know-how available. Only then we can talk about the real contribution of nuclear science and technology to sustainable development. It has to benefit uh, humankind, have a real social economic impact, create jobs and sustain itself by maintaining a sharing and knowledge transfer. I always like to say here that uh, we need to do the socialization of science. We need to understand how the nuclear science and technology plays a pivotal role in our day-to-day -day lives and how the industry and the government can be able to partner with us to address these needs and challenges of our member states. Nuclear uh, techniques and technologies are widely applied in many uh, different areas of, of daily life. And there is a growing demand for application of nuclear technology worldwide. Just to give you an example, in 2019, 147 countries and territories received support through the agency's technical cooperation program, including 35 least developed countries. The technical cooperation program is the primary mechanism for the provision of IAEA assistance and the transfer of uh, nuclear technology to the member states. We count 122 active coordinated research projects as indicated on my slide, these activities aim to develop new technologies and adopt them to the pressing needs of the member states. Given this degree of interest among the national governments and industry and the expansion of the application of the technology, we must ask ourselves what role governments and the industries are playing in sustaining the knowledge on the technology transferred by the IAEA to developing countries. It's very important whatever we do, we must be able to continue uh, sustaining it and have a very clear sustainability plan. Before I closing, moderator, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, shed some few uh, light on some few initiatives that we've had uh, in the recent past here at the IAEA. One, I would like to provide an overview of the IAEA assistance over the past year in support of member states uh, needs to relate to COVID-19. We all know that we are facing this unprecedented situation of the COVID-19. And as our DG, DG Grossi always says, nothing stops at the IAEA, not for a minute. We were able to support a request from 120 uh, countries and territories uh, with the PCRs, equipments, and diagnostic kits uh, towards uh, COVID-19. This project has become the largest in the history of the agency technical cooperation program, so far mobilizing uh, 26.4 million euro in the extra budgetary funding to deliver complete package of detection equipment, uh, equipment to countries around the world. As a result, 286 national laboratories and institutions have been designated to receive support by the recipient uh, states. This is another very important initiative uh, here, try to bridge the gap of gender. Our DG also has initiated uh, what we call the Mari uh, 
a Slodowska Curie Fellowship, and is a fellowship specifically designed to support young women with their postgraduate training. And here um, we have been able to receive support from several uh, donors, uh, and also one company has come forward, uh, you know, um, assuring us of opportunities for internship. And I would like to urge if there are companies around and they're willing to do so, if you could link us, uh, you know, uh, we will be more than happy to provide you with more information. This is a program that will be able to bridge the gap of gender in science, technology, and innovation, and in particular in areas of nuclear science and technology at the postgraduate level. Another uh, initiative is uh, what we call Zodiac, the Zoonotic uh, uh, disease Integrated Action Initiative, uh, Zodiac places research and development and technology at its core. The objective here is to strengthen the preparedness and capa uh, capa uh, capabilities of the member states to rapidly detect and timely respond to zoonotic disease outbreak. It's a joint initiative which is being led by the IAEA in collaboration with the World Health Organization the Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations, FAO, and the World Organization of Animal Health, OIE, and other partners, institutions, and laboratories. This is my uh, last slide. And since the last review conference in 2015, international community, community has come together to launch and endorse sustainable development goals with the aim of ending poverty, protecting the planet and ensuring that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. The 10th review conference will be the first opportunity to reflect on the link between the SDGs and the non-proliferation treaty. This means uh, the link between the SDGs and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. It will also be an opportunity to relaunch the debate around the dialogue with the nuclear industry and the private sector and about the place of the public-private partnership in sustaining nuclear science and technology. And I would like to emphasize here, I think this is the conversation that we need to have. How can we all be able to play a role so that we can be able to address the social economic development of developing world? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Abdurazak. Um, it, it's you set up very well what the importance is of, of industry to the work of the IAEA and how it is a multiplier. Uh, and also thanks for putting so clearly on the table the role of industry and the the, uh, the role of governments um, to to uh, provide for, or to provide for sustainability uh, and especially uh, in the form of public-private partnerships. So thank you very much uh, for that. And also I, I wanted to say uh, thanks for pointing out the size of the market. Um, uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, so it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, and those examples you gave them really help understand uh, what it is about, especially to those that do not have a, a background in, uh, in this so much. So thanks very much for your presentation or your keynote address. Um, and with that, we'll move to the to the panel. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have four uh, very good panelists, and I would like to uh, welcome the first one, uh, Mr. Charles Oko, the uh, counselor of the Nigerian uh, permanent mission to uh, to Vienna, who will be our first uh, first panelist. Um, Charles, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased that you could all make it to today's webinar, and I express our gratitude to the UN Office on Disarmament Affairs, as well as the IAEA, for this beneficial series of collaboration and for the honor of inviting me to speak on this panel. Similarly, and at the outset, I must express our gratitude and satisfaction with the far-reaching consultations of Ambassador Slavinen, the Argentine president-designate, whose work continues to enjoy our support 
and we salute the new perspectives and fresh ideas himself and the Bureau, including yourself, Madam Chair, designated of Main Committee 3, are introducing into the discussion as we approach the 10th review conference. <clears throat> Madam Moderator, the third pillar of the NPT represents the only legitimate manner in which the potential of the atom should be applied, peaceful uses. The drafters of the treaty in Articles 4 and 5 set a template for global cooperation in the peaceful uses sphere. The third pillar, though lacking in the level of attention which it should ordinarily enjoy, has nonetheless registered significant progress. Not only are there increased applications of nuclear technology for peaceful uses in various fields across developing countries, there is a direct link between that increase and the adherence of such countries to the NPT or they are becoming parties to the treaty. <clears throat> Furthermore, and thanks to the NPT framework on the one hand and the good work of the IAEA on the other hand, there is reason to believe that the demand for peaceful uses by state parties of the NPT and member states of the UN and the IAEA will continue to increase in the years ahead as nuclear and nuclear derived techniques have proven to be a reliable option for addressing several global and everyday challenges, including electricity generation, where there is a huge shortage in many parts of the world, but also in non-power applications like human health, particularly cancer control, but also in food and nutrition, including food safety, isotope hydrology, and many other applications. What is more, Nuclear technologies continue to provide or are able to provide useful assistance to states in their efforts to meet and achieve important global paths like the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Paris Climate Change Agreement. There is therefore a huge need for collaboration with all stakeholders, including with industry. In appreciation of the successes of the MPT, in particular its third pillar, but also mindful of the gap that continues to exist, the need for collaboration with other stakeholders to make nuclear technologies more accessible for peaceful, safe, secure, and sustainable use becomes paramount. Industry is a major stakeholder in this regard. As state parties and the UN system on the one hand, they need to better understand industry and the need for industry to better understand us becomes more glaring. I believe that the MPT Review Conference is an important platform for such understanding to intensify. And Madam Moderator, so when I talk about industries generally, it's a broad use. It could be transport industry, it could be health, it could be nuclear fuel cycle produce and, and all of that. The IAEA is a significant player in the field of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. The agency has deepened over the last many years its proficiency and its competence in the field of providing technical assistance to her member states to enable them in the peaceful use of nuclear energy. In this regard, I would emphasize that the IAEA Technical Cooperation Program, the main vehicle through which it delivers support to member states, has been most successful, especially in view of the very limited resources at its disposal. Those media resources have been very well managed with tangible results to show across the world. And just for emphasis, the IAEA Technical Cooperation Fund uh, has assessed the voluntary assessment, the entire basket is just about 86 million euros, but the work it does is far much more than that. The agency has not remained stagnant and is quite dynamic. And over the years, it has proven to us as member states that it takes into account the changing global environment. The agency has moved from a motto of atoms for peace to a motto of atoms for peace and development, thus better highlighting the development components of its mandate enshrined in Article 2 of its statutes, but also the third pillar of the MPT, for which the IAEA plays an important role. <clears throat> More recently, the Director General, Rafael Grossi, and the Secretariat appears to be carefully widening the space for cooperation, even with non-traditional partners, including industry. 
This is a welcome move, and we are cautiously optimistic that this partnership would increase both the basket of funds available to the agency, the technical resources it can draw upon, and also help to make the agency's work more impactful in both the long and short term. I will try to give an example. In November 2019, well before the current awful pandemic broke, the Technical Assistance and Cooperation Committee of the IAEA Board of Governors approved an interregional technical cooperation project, IIT0098, which Director Shaukat referred to just now. The project aimed to strengthen the capacities of member states in building, strengthening, and restoring capacities and services in the case of outbreaks, emergencies, and disasters. Subsequently, when the pandemic broke, the project which was already approved, which shows the foresight of the agency, its secretariat, and its member states, became the vehicle through which the largest ever TC project <coughs> was delivered to member states. The agency provided assistance to 128 countries and territories, including one country that is not a member state of the agency. On the back of that success, the agency has introduced Zodiac, which director recently uh, referred to. Now, what is important in the context of today's discussion is that in delivering on that TC project, a Japanese industrial entity, if a biopharmaceutical company, Takeda, I'm told, made a contribution of 4.35 million euros to the IAEA to enable the project. Another industrial entity, Onreco, has made a contribution of 40,000 euros to an of the DG's flagship projects, the Marie Skodowska Courier Fellowship Projects. These examples, these two examples, may be considered corporate social responsibility, but I believe that a time has come for partnerships to go beyond corporate social responsibility to practical, impactful engagements and collaborations. It is possible and welcome for the IAEA to continue collaborating with industry the delivery of its mandate without losing its integrity or compromising the necessary ethos of ethical independence in a win-win for both parties. The agency wishes to assist our member states in peaceful, <coughs> safe and secure use of nuclear technologies. An industry, I believe, would like to sell their technologies for profit on a sustainable basis. A win-win is possible. The agency supports our member states to develop the necessary environment and the national ecosystem where nuclear technologies can be used in a safe, secure, and sustainable manner. When such an ecosystem is well developed, industry would also benefit because when the competence of the member state is enhanced, the member state is better able to use the technologies to buy them and to use them in a sustainable manner. I believe, therefore, that there is a possibility for a symbiotic and mutually beneficial relationship between the industry and between the agency. What can the agency do? But I'm moderator. While we continue to look for ways and means to increase collaboration, allow me to make a few suggestions. One of the ways I think the industry can be of assistance is adaptability. It is important to bear in mind that the end users in developing countries, for example, vary from those in the more developed countries of the world. The operating environment and the level of technological advancement also vary. Accordingly, industry should be persuaded to consider developing or adapting existing technologies to be more fit for purpose for developing countries. This could be true for small and modular reactors or for micro reactors, as well as technologies in use in healthcare, as well as gamma irradiation where possible. Related to adaptation and, adapt and adaptability is affordability. <clears throat> Many crucial technologies and their cost of maintenance and use is high for developing countries, including in my region, where I have traveled extensively and worked on this subject, especially the least developed and low-income countries. And coincidentally, those least developed and low-income countries are the countries with the greatest need for these technologies. Maintenance services and spare parts are not easily available, which often results in months of downtime when no patients can be treated in cancer treatment centers, for example. Industry should consider developing innovative solutions to address these needs. 
like establishing regional spare parts hubs or service centers. In adapting where possible and making the equipment and technologies less cumbersome from a technical point of view, perhaps we could achieve not only affordability, but also accessibility and sustainability for the interested countries, which would also increase trust in the equipment and the equipment provider and ultimately higher turnover for industry. Where possible, consideration should also be given to the financing and paying methods. Take for example, a linear accelerator used in cancer treatment could be quite expensive for a country that is least developed or a low income country. Is it possible for us as MPT state parties to have this discussion with major producers to consider arrangements whereby MPT state parties who have obtained the necessary capacity and training from the IAEA could receive the equipment on a financing model that is more flexible and spread out in installments. In some countries, the aging crop of nuclear professionals require that we deliberately build a new crop of younger professionals to replace them, bearing in mind the gender perspective. I think that, but at the same time, in other countries, where there have been no access to nuclear technology, we need to develop a new cadre of professionals. The agency is working to support the workforce in her member states and working to strengthen capacity building. We would encourage industry to support these efforts, both through the IAEA and bilaterally with the, with the concerned countries. Efforts to achieve South-South cooperation would also benefit from more cooperation between the industry and the UN system, including the IAEA. The last point I would make on recommendations is that addressing the delays and denials of shipments of radioactive sources is an area in need of urgent attention. Madam Chair, <clears throat> the shipment of radioactive material, which includes life-saving sources used in medical, agriculture, and industrial sectors, is an example where collaboration between countries, policymakers, and the transport industry especially shipping and air companies is essential to ensuring continued access to radioactive sources. I've been told that over the last 20 years, the number of shipping lines and airlines or transport companies willing to ship or carry radioactive sources from one point to the point of need appears to be reducing instead of increasing. In summary, and for the sake of time, I believe that we need to work and to work with industry to identify the areas relevant to our common interests, and we need to intensify cooperation to achieve this. I am hopeful that the next review conference of the MPT would be a good platform to further this objective for the betterment of the world. Madam Chair, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I will stop here now, and I thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions subsequently. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. I wanted to thank um, uh, Charles for his presentation uh, and uh, for coining the, the, the phrase win-win uh, in this context uh, and also for setting out his recommendations on um, adaptability, financing mechanisms, capacity building and, and addressing these denials of shipments uh, problems. So, so thanks very much and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions afterwards. But first of all, we're going to listen to our second panelist, Dr. Sama Bilbao Ilion, the Director, Director General of the World Nuclear Organizations. Uh, organization. Sama, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Van de Leyen. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides, yes? Yes, well, I can see them. Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies and the Secretary General, distinguished representatives of member states, dear colleagues. It is truly an honor for me to represent today the global nuclear energy industry in this event and to join such a distinguished panel in this virtual stage. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was conceived uh, when the world was at 
was at a crossroads. We had two atomic colossi eyeing each other with suspicion, and there were prospects of several more countries developing atomic weapons. Then, uh, with immense vision, General Eisenhower proposed steps in his Atoms for Peace speech, which would eventually lead to the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The vision was to harness the atom not for instilling fear, but for improving the economic welfare of the world. In his own words, hasten the day when fear of the atom will begin to disappear from the minds of the people and the governments of the East and the West. Well, today, uh, humanity is also at a crossroads as we face the enormity and the urgency of the climate change challenge. Despite large investment in renewable energy sources, the share of low carbon electricity generated today is essentially the same as 20 years ago. And our present country commitments and policies do not really lead us to the 1.5 degree or much less, uh, or, or also the two degree scenario that the IPCC recommends. And the problem will only get worse as less developed nations continue to increase their demand for energy in an effort to meet the same standard of livings, uh, standards of living as developed nations for all their citizens. This autumn, the United Nations General Assembly will discuss energy for the first time in 40 years. And also this year, nations will get together in Glasgow for the 26th uh, Conference of the Parties on Climate Change to consider more ambitious decarbonization targets and to develop realistic approaches that will get us there. So once again, a bold vision is required. In that sense, I truly think that the 10th Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference gives us a major opportunity to contribute to addressing this existential crisis. Why? Well, because the NPT is a bargain by which countries that forswear the development of nuclear weapons programs and meet their commitments should have access to the fuel be full benefits of peaceful applications of nuclear technology. And nuclear power is the single most proven, scalable tool that we have today to meet the world's growing energy needs without contributing to climate change. Nuclear technologies bring unmatched benefits. First of all, they have a proven track record. Nuclear power plants have operated safely, reliably, and cost-effectively all over the world for more than 60 years. And they have done so without the emission of greenhouse gases or any other contaminants. And they have carefully manage the very low volumes of used nuclear fuel and radioactive waste that have been produced since the beginning of the deployment of nuclear power. Nuclear energy is today the single largest source of low carbon electricity in developed countries. And furthermore, nuclear power plants produce dependable, always on, output indispensable for today's society, for all kinds of, kinds of essential services, such as hospital, industry, and, and for example, this internet that we have been using uh, very much during this terrible pandemic. Furthermore, nuclear power plants can also operate flexibly, supporting the deployment of intermittent renewable generation and ensuring a robust and resilient energy system. Nuclear energy is also a cost-effective climate change mitigator. Extending the operation of the current fleet of nuclear reactors is the single lowest cost form of additional low carbon generation, as you can see in this graphic. Furthermore, uh, new reactors are competitive with other low carbon generation sources, particularly when the total costs of the entire system and the value of the avoided emissions are included into the cost of generation. Furthermore, nuclear uh, energy can go well beyond electricity. 
as the only low carbon source that can produce electricity and heat, nuclear energy could play an important role in decarbonizing other difficult to abate sectors. Nuclear reactors could be used to produce process heat for industrial applications, district heating to condition buildings, uh, fresh water through desalination, or zero carbon hydrogen and synthetic low carbon fuels that can help decarbonize the transportation sector. Nuclear energy deployment efficiently promotes national and local economic growth. It provides long-term high-skilled jobs and has significant multiplier effects in many sectors of the economy. For developing countries, nuclear energy projects can be a catalyst to overall socio-economic development while helping limit reliance on, social, on uh, fossil fuels. As you can see in this graphic, zero carbon, 24-7 affordable nuclear power contributes to most uh, sustainable development goals and can be essential to meet the aspiration of individuals in all nations. Better education, access to stable jobs, nutritious diets, better healthcare, and uh, access to the cultural and leisure activities that truly enable a higher quality of living. In particular, <clears throat> I think this increased access to affordable and reliable energy helps enhance labor emancipation and reduce the abundance of menial jobs, which disproportionately affects women. More free time and access to education will give women all over the world equal opportunities to contribute to society at all levels. Today, the global nuclear industry con continues to innovate and make the most of the lessons learned and the experience accumulated through decades of successful nuclear power generation. Uh, I showed you uh, in, this, in this slide a few of the recent successes of new nuclear power plants that have been recently deployed. And I also show you that there are today 54 nuclear reactors under construction all over the world. And there is a lot of excitement about new technologies such as small modular reactors, micro reactors, advanced reactors. These technologies not only can be more affordable, but they are also highly customizable to many specialized markets and applications, which opens new opportunities to integrate dispatchable nuclear power in the increasingly distributed and highly coupled energy systems of the future. Yet, uh, it is absolutely indispensable to accelerate the deployment of nuclear power if we are to satisfy global energy demand, if we are to achieve the, the very ambitious climate targets that we have set for ourselves and to help the world, the entire world, to meet the sustainable development goals. So in that sense, government leadership and government support is needed to instill confidence in nuclear technology and to incentivize long-term planning and private investment into these technologies. So let me close uh, by, by emphasize the importance of UN agencies and the NPT signatories to play a key role in the sustainable energy transition. For that, uh, we call upon the signatories of the NPT to acknowledge that nuclear technology along other low carbon energy technologies, of course, is essential to the sound environmental stewardship of our planet and to mitigate the threat from global warming. We call on you to pursue efforts to develop the potential of nuclear technology in harmony with the economic welfare of the world through an integrated approach by the various UN agencies and many other multilateral organizations, including the international development banks. We call on you to work towards the harmonization of regulatory uh, uh, frameworks to facilitate the internationalization of nuclear technology. 
we call upon you to facilitate the transfer of nuclear technology for peaceful purposes to all countries as they develop a robust and streamlined regulatory regime that meets, of course, the objectives of the NPT while ensuring the safety and the security of the commercial and social operations. And of course, we know that the NPT has been incredibly successful in, in the military sense, but I think that there is still a need to conquer the irrational fear of radiation, which is unfortunately restricting the development of nuclear technology. Part of this can be done through regulating the radiological risks uh, of nuclear technology in a commensurate way to other risks that we face. So I want to close here uh, by reassure all of you that the global nuclear energy industry collectively supports the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as the cornerstone for the peaceful uses of nuclear technology. And nuclear technology, nuclear energy, today and for more than 80 years is contributing safely and securely to the well-being of people throughout the world and its use can be further expanded to satisfy global energy demand, achieve our very ambitious climate goals uh, that we have set ourselves in the Paris Agreement and just as importantly, to help the world meet the sustainable development goals. With this, I give it back to you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Babao Ilion, for your, uh, I had an echo, but it's gone, I think, um, for your presentation and, and for setting out the urgency of decarbonizing uh, electricity uh, generation and for making a pitch for the role in, uh, in nuclear energy in that. Um, and also to set out what is necessary within the NPT framework in order to promote that. So thanks very much for your for your presentation, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions afterwards. Um, but uh, but now first uh, we move to the next presentation, which is by Mr. Sajis Babu, the uh, chairperson of the International Committee for Non-Destructive Testing. And we've already heard a little bit before about non-destructive testing, so that's a, that has been a good introduction, I hope. Um, but please, we're Ready for Mr. Babu, you have the floor. I can see your slides already. But I cannot uh, hear you yet. Yeah, sorry, uh, there is some, um, give me a second. Sure. And I see now it's Dr. Babu, so apologies. Thank you, Ambassador Vangela, Excellency Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, Ambassador Slavinen, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to participate in the webinar on the 10th NPT review. I will be giving you a quick overview of ICNDT and a perspective of how we work together with the agency in terms of technology transfer. Earlier, we have been heard from uh, Mr. Abdul Razak in terms of NDT applications uh, for uh, nuclear applications, including the power industry sector. NDT is one such technology to keep us everyone safe, and also it identifies the soundness of a material and structures. In general, we use uh, radiation technologies such as the X-rays or isotopes for inspections. Um, and also we use other NDT technologies such as phased array, infrared, uh, to ensure our reactors are working safe. To give you a bit of overview of the ICNDT, uh, ICNDT is a world NDT organization which comprises of four regions. 66 members and actively uh, in a collective format to work on a global growth of NDT. It consists of executives coming from individuals, nominees from different regions, which provides a unique network for multilateral corporations between NDT societies devoted to this development of science and practice of NDT for the benefit of public worldwide. 
In a nutshell, our vision is to create a safer world through wider use of NDT and diagnostics technologies. And mission is to work together with this global network of NDT societies and regional group for the promotion and development of science and practice of NDT for the benefit of the public worldwide. You all can ask what's the need for an NDT. NDT is uh, important, I would say, often unseen, but vitally important for keeping us safe, protecting the public from incidents that would otherwise happen. Neither you fly on a flight or you take a train or you're getting your power from a nuclear power plant. NDT is also very important for any new build construction, in-service inspections, as well as the life extension programs. Sorry. OK. IAEA and ICNDT has a very long relationship. ICNDT has been supporting the development of implementation for almost 60 years. And ICNDT has a license status with the agency to promote the NDT and technology transfer to developing countries through our international membership. Although ICNDT, you can see uh, 60 plus members, our IAEA has 170 member states, and there are a lot of developing countries still struggling in gaining these technologies for the peace use of the industry. ICNDT got some working group five, which is in specific for radiation protections led by our general secretary, Mr. David Gilbert, who is putting a lot of effort in uh, terms of radiation protection being dispersed across different countries. And together with uh, IAEA, there are two uh, main programs which is uh, going around. It's the RCA, uh, Regional Cooperation Agreement, uh, as well as the Akal region. It's been uh, almost been there for uh, now last uh, uh, 10 over years. The two important projects, I would say, the RAS1022 and the Akal regional project, which is RLA1014. This has been done through our historic discussions held in the European Conference in Sweden uh, to put a common uh, syllabus in terms of uh, training materials and NDT for civil structures. And the collaboration has initiated between RCA and ARCAL and also the European partners. It's been increasing opportunities for a significant impact towards developing capabilities and capacities in NDT applications for civil engineering infrastructures in response to the common interests and priority needs. And the RCA projects have been continued to develop over years for swinging earlier for harmonizations within the member states on early 2000 for personal certifications. And now it becomes more into very specific subjects, including concrete inspections uh, for both pre and post disaster uh, events. And one such ACAL project, it's happening in the Latin American region as well as the Caribbean, and it's been uh, fully supported by the agencies to include the advanced NDT in civil industrial structures. The current participating countries include Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, and others who have obtained advances during this last four years, which was started in 2018. And Argentina has been translated the phased array ultrasonic, which has been supported by Australia into Spanish language, and it's been adopted by IRM and been used for examinations within Argentina, and it's been beyond the South American region. During 2020, most of our joint activities were suspended because of the COVID-19. However, there are a lot of workshops being held along the way, which um, uh, Andy has been offered, including a virtual training course in level three in the um, um, South American region. ICNDT has now looked into the recent developments, say NDE 4.0, uh, which has been uh, highly adopted and a recent international conference being held together in partnership with the German Society for NDT. This is something, a new branch out into the industry where we want to have a better um, uh, research versus applications in terms of having defect deductions 
to increase the probability and reliability of uh, deduction of discontinuities so that you could avoid any catastrophic accidents uh, into the applications. There has been a setting up a series of workshops which has been planned on the 20th World Conference and ICDT being an aggregator between research and industry, which move from a theoretical applications into practical real case examples. And currently we work with the strategic uh, partners, which are the national societies to put forward the new standards, person certifications and applications, which helps both for the power and nuclear industry. And there is a world conference was being planned in uh, 2020. The agency uh, also has a plan to have a workshop together with the conference, but unfortunately due to COVID, it has been postponed uh, almost uh, two years. Now it will be a plan to be delivered between February 28th to March 4. It's a, it's a five days conference in Incheon and um, pretty much it's been uh, everybody is very optimistic to deliver this. Currently, it's talking about 1,107 uh, papers uh, with having 740 uh, registrants for this conference with 340 exhibitors who is putting all the new technologies in terms of uh, power, nuclear, as well as the aerospace applications in NDT. And this is a kind of uh, timeline which we are looking into this conference. If anyone is interested into these technologies, please, um, we'd be happy to uh, welcome you in our next uh, world conference. So uh, to putting a, a closing note, uh, NDT is uh, often unseen, but it's very important to provide a safer world. And uh, one of the nuclear byproducts, which is the radioactive isotopes, it's very well used and safely used in the terms of NDT applications. In the same way, NDT has been given to safeguard our uh, reactors to ensure the safety and security of the systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Babu, for explaining uh, the importance of NTT and especially the whole world that is uh, behind uh, that in organizational terms, which uh, I was not uh, not aware of. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, now I'd like to move to the last speaker of uh, of the panel, uh, Mrs. Nicole Denjoy of the Vice Chair of the Global Diagnostic Imaging, Healthcare IT and Radiation Therapy Association. I yes. can already see your presentation. You see uh, the presentation? Okay, excellent. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, I would like uh, to uh, uh, deeply thank you for inviting uh, me in uh, this um, in this um, uh, virtual uh, conference, let's say. And uh, of course, uh, the purpose of my presentation would be uh, totally different, I think, from the previous ones, as I will be um, uh, uh, focusing on medical applications of uh, nuclear technology. Yeah. So um, tell me if uh, slides are moving. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yeah. OK, so I will. Um, I will uh, give you uh, first uh, an, uh, um, an introduction about what is DITA, you know, uh, the organization I represent. Uh, then uh, uh, also give you some history or let's say about nuclear, nuclear application to medical imaging and radiotherapy, including uh, cobalt teletherapy and brachytherapy. And then we'll finish uh, with some conclusions. Yeah. So, um, DITA is a, is a global trade association. It's a federation of association and it includes more than 600 companies in the healthcare domain. We are representing the, uh, the, the industry sectors such as uh, diagnostic imaging, radiation therapy, health IT, electromedical and radiopharmaceuticals. And our industries uh, are global players and are highly uh, innovative, yeah? So, um, uh, yes, what a, sorry. This is uh, just uh, to represent uh, the, the DITA global presence, uh, among, you know, at the European, at the global level. Uh, we are in official relations uh, with uh, 
WHO. We have also since 2016 uh, um, a partnership agreement with the World Bank. Uh, and of course, we work uh, on a regular basis with IAEA, which is uh, highly appreciated. So, uh, looking into nuclear applications to medical imaging and treatment, uh, um, <clears throat> I, I would like uh, to say that we have a long, long history, as you can see, uh, on nuclear applications uh, in the medical field in imaging and therapy. <clears throat> on therapy uh, with brachytherapy since uh, 1901, on uh, uh, stereotactic uh, ra radiosurgery since 1949, um, and uh, on, tele te on teletherapy since 1953, and on imaging since uh, 1976. Again, in interest of time, I'm not going to read uh, all the details, and the presentation will be available to be shared uh, with uh, all of you um, and the participant uh, that, that uh, is no problem. So on nuclear imaging, uh, uh, there are two specific technologies that are used in nuclear medicine, namely uh, the PET and the SPECT. Yeah? Uh, and those are providing physicians with information about how tissues and organs are functioning and they are used uh, specifically for neurological diseases such as Alzheimer and multiple sclerosis, cancer and, uh, and uh, heart, heart disease. On uh, PECT and, and now, uh, you know, with innovations, uh, the industries have also combined, you know, PET and SPECT uh, together with uh, CT, you know, with computed tomography and uh, uh, today, um, they are performed on instruments that are combined with uh, CT scanners. The com combined scans have been shown to provide more accurate uh, diagnosis uh, than uh, the two scans performed separately, as you can see in the different images. And the PET uh, uh, CT scans are very useful for evaluating the efficacy and surgery procedure and local cancer. Uh, when you look at uh, another imaging, uh, uh, nuclear imaging uh, uh, combination, you, you have also the PET combined with MRI uh, that combine the unique features of MRI with uh, uh, quantitative uh, physiological information that is provided by PET. So excellent uh, soft uh, tissue contrast, uh, diffusion uh, weighted images, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, uh, and so on, and the MR spectroscopy. So uh, PET MRI is a, a technology that is preferred for brain imaging. Uh, on, uh, of course, for all these uh, uh, equipment, we need radio pharmaceuticals, and the radio isotopes are used in PET spect uh, to label tracers. Uh, um, various also drugs and other chemicals can be labeled uh, with uh, these isotopes. Uh, the type of tracer used depends on what the doctor wants, in fact, uh, to measure. For example, um, radio labeled uh, glucose uh, can be used for detecting cancer as it is metabolized by the tumor. Um, the last uh, on uh, nuclear imaging, the production of radiopharmaceuticals for imaging, uh, radio uh, isotopes, isotopes for molecular imaging can be produced by irradiating a specific uh, target inside a nuclear research reactor or in particle accelerators such as uh, cyclotrons. Uh, the wide use of uh, uh, PET uh, radionuclide uh, can be prepared in large quantities in a cyclotron with an energy that uh, is ranking from 9 to uh, 19 MeV. So high, higher energy machines are also needed for preparation of the commonly used uh, spectral radionuclide. On, uh, then uh, if we move on uh, radiation therapy, um, we have uh, radiation therapy that is using ionizing radiation generally provided as part of cancer treatment to control or kill uh, malignant cells. Uh, they are delivered by teletherapy or brachytherapy and used uh, in, to cure several types of localized cancer. 
Um, and as you can see on the right side, one out of two people with cancer would benefit from radiotherapy. But unfortunately, this is not uh, that known uh, right now for multiple reasons, uh, either uh, an availability of the equipment or an availability of uh, resources or uh, skilled people or lack of uh, reimbursement. Yeah. So RT is also used as part of adjuvant therapy to prevent a tumor uh, recurrence after surgery to remove a primary malignant tumor, for example, early stage of breast cancer or in the palliative treatment. So um, in, uh, uh, we have uh, then stereotactic radiosurgery that is a form of radiotherapy for the destruction of a pre uh, precisely selected areas of tissues uh, ionizing radiation rather than excision with a scalpel. scalpel. So stereotactic uh, radiosurgery was first developed in 1949 uh, uh, by a Swedish uh, neurosurgical Lars uh, Le Lexel that uh, you see the picture on the right side. Uh, and the stereotactic uh, radiosurgery enables accurate co correlation of a virtual target seen in the patient diagnosis images with the actual uh, target position in the patient. So uh, the other possibility is a serotactic uh, gamma radiosurgery, uh, where uh, that is using multiple uh, non-complanar simultaneous beams, um, and uh, uh, those. Uh, this is a, a way of treating certain brain tumor with accuracy, precision, and with low dose outside of the target from the scattered uh, radiation. Um, and then on stereotactic radiosurgery and radiotherapy, uh, we have also two um, possibilities. As you can see, a robotic uh, linear accelerator that is in fact uh, uh, moving around the patient. Yeah, and then you have the C-arm LINAC that is more fixed and that is uh, treating uh, uh, a specific area of uh, the human body. Then uh, proton therapy is also a type of uh, particle therapy that is uh, using uh, a beam of proton to irradiate uh, diseases uh, tissues. And the advantage of proton therapy is that the dose of proton is deposited over a narrow range of depth, which results in minimal entry exit or scattered radiation dose to healthy nearby tissues. On brachytherapy, uh, this is also uh, another type of technology that is uh, very important. I will uh, go a little bit faster that it can be used uh, in combination with other therapies uh, such as RT and chemotherapy. Uh, also uh, on brachytherapy flavors, we have low dose rates, high dose rates and uh, post dose rates uh, depending on uh, uh, what is being uh, uh, you know, um, required by by uh, the the physicians uh, and the sources, uh, the high uh, activity sources such as uh, uh, IR 192 and COBAT 60 are produced in high flux uh, nuclear reactors. Yeah. So uh, I will finish uh, with those conclusions uh, here. Uh, uh, by saying that uh, nuclear application in healthcare have been saving lives of patients for the past uh, 15 years, uh, 50 years, uh, sorry, 500 million imaging procedures in EU every year have been performed, 2 million patients received radiation therapy in the EU every year. Um, so uh, innovations in detector technologies, uh, imaging reconstruction, treatment planning and artificial intelligence are also expanding uh, uh, the application and the benefits of those, of those uh, technologies uh, uh, and national and different requirements for the security of sources are putting at risk uh, the access uh, to such technologies. Uh, so this is where we need uh, to find a balance um, uh, to continue to use those uh, very uh, important technologies. And uh, last, uh, there is um, uh, an IEC, you know, international uh, project uh, that is uh, currently being developed uh, on, uh, you know, uh, electrical equipment containing high activity sealed radioactive uh, sources. Uh, and this standard uh, can provide a good basis for future uh, nuclear application. 
uh, I would like uh, to make a last uh, remark uh, to uh, the op uh, with regards to um, uh, the opening remark from Uzumi uh, that uh, was uh, highly appreciated, and uh, I strongly believe that uh, the, the way to move forward uh, in a win-win situation is to have multi-stakeholders uh, wor working together. And uh, industry is providing tools, but on the other hand, IAEA has an important role uh, and uh, governments have uh, important roles as well uh, to see how those technologies can be, uh, you know, uh, used and optimized at uh, affordable costs. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ms. Denjoy and Nicole, uh, for the presentation on the different uses and, and different types of, uh, of therapy. Um, I, I have learned a, a lot and I like the picture you showed of Mr. Lexel in uh, 49. There was a little skull and I'm glad technology has moved forward since then because I'm not sure yeah. I would like to be the subject, but it's impressive uh, uh, what is out there. And thank you for your message of the need to have this multi-stakeholder approach. Um, I, uh, I think it's a very good one. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. And with that, we conclude our panelists, our, our panel. Uh, we've heard about applications in health um, and energy and non-destructive testing, and also about the role of the IAEA and how industry can be um, a multiplier for the IAEA uh, and um, how all this relates to the MPT. So with that, I would like to turn to Ambassador Slaviden, our, our own president-designate of the MPT Review Conference, uh, to deliver some closing remarks. Uh, Gustavo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marilyn. Could you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Uh, Representative Nakamitsu, dear Izumi, Ambassador Van Delent, dear Marilyn, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I want to express my gratitude to the, uh, both to the UN Office for the Summer Affairs and the IAEA for arranging today's event. I also want to thank our very distinguished panelists for their insights. What we have heard today from this excellent discussion reinforces what I learned during my time at the IAEA. That is the centrality of collaboration with the industry to the successful uptake of the peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology. This is a lesson also learned by governments around the world where partnerships in the field continue to bear fruit with the IAEA in a facilitating role. Now it is time for the MPT to set up its game. I doubt the drafters of the MPT could have envisaged the spectrum of applications that nuclear science and technology would have in the 21st century. But at the 10th review conference, it is something we should be applauded. Industry, as we have heard today, includes the experts that are involved in the various day-to-day -day uses of nuclear science and technology, and their insights are essential uh, to ensuring the entire world can benefit from them. From energy, agriculture, drinking water, protection of fisheries, understanding climate change and oceans, to human health and the fight against this terrible pandemic, nuclear innovations are making the world a better place for all its inhabitants. These are valuable endeavors that should be advertised to the widest possible audience. And I can think of no better venue to capitalize on the industry's rich and expertise than the 10th MPT Review Conference. The treaty with its near universal membership is a powerful convening tool that includes states from across the spectrum of development, from those creating the technology to those who desperately need it. Throughout my tenure as president designate, I have heard many calls for an inclusive review conference. This is something I thoroughly endorse because I believe that a plurality of views helps produce lasting results. 
for the review conference. This means providing equitable and meaningful participation for women, space for civil society to express their views, and an opportunity for the younger generations to have their say, as well as a platform for industry to inject their perspectives. Today's panel reiterates what is being heard in forums around the world in the lead up to the Rio conference. The critical importance that all state parties place on access to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, science and technology. It is unfortunate that throughout the history of the NPT, the third pillar has been often overlooked or taken for granted. This clearly misrepresents the intentions of the treaty's negotiators. They understood that while the splitting of the atom could have catastrophic consequences, it also held remarkable promise for all humankind. This also, they also understood that guaranteed access to peaceful uses would be critical to achieving support for the treaty's other pillars, the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, under eventual elimination, nuclear disarmament. As president designate of the Rio conference, it is my intention to ensure that state parties are committed to achieving a balanced outcome across all three pillars and to seek tangible progress in each. Our ambition should be a Rio conference that commits state parties to facilitating the benefits of peaceful uses, that seeks to add value to the work being done in this field, especially that undertaken by the IAA. You should consider what the role of industry can be in achieving that goal, and I think it would also be beneficial for industry to publicly commit to the goals of the MPT. Just as with the review conference itself, the pandemic has made it also difficult to bring the plans to fruition but we can remain hopeful that when it does take place, the MPT and the Global Nuclear Industry Forum, which is being co-organized by some of those present here, will also be held to provide a unique opportunity for the nuclear industry to highlight its many positive contributions to improve the quality of life and well-being of people around the world. The forum could help serve to remind participants of the linkages to the framework provided by the MPT to facilitate access to the peaceful applications worldwide and to consider the industry's role and commitment into the future. I understand that consideration is also being given to endorsing at the forum of a statement for presentations to the presidency of the Rio conference, highlighting the importance of the MPT for the nuclear industry on the industry's role and commitment to the treaty and its goals, and I welcome that. To conclude, let me once again reiterate the importance that we work together to strengthen the MPT and the benefits it provides, not just for state parties, but the international community as a whole. And I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Destiny and South Slovenian, uh, Gustavo, for, for these remarks, um, nicely bringing it all together. Um, we, we have um, extremely little time for questions, but nevertheless, I would like to open the floor for, for questions. If you have any, um, could you please indicate so in the chat? And I will have a look at the chat if any requests for uh, the possibility to ask questions are, are coming up. Because um, we could take a, a couple. I'm not seeing anything uh, yet, but I'm also asking our, our technical support, whether that is my connection or uh, whether that is uh, because we have all been so uh, informed so exhaustively that there are no questions now. Ah, I see. Um, 
I see a question by uh, Jorge Julio Fujimora, and I'm sorry, I can't read the rest of the name. I, I would like to ask you to um, switch on your, your microphone and camera so that you can ask the question uh, yourself to the panelists. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for all uh, your presentations. Uh, it, it were very interesting for me. I, I am Jorge Fujimura, diplomat from Peru, and and I would like to to ask uh, about the Zodiac project. I would like to know if there's any coordination uh, with the World Health Organization for the implementation of this of this new project of the IAEA. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Jorge. Um, are there further questions? Because then we, we could take a few at the same time. Ah, I see uh, Mahmoud Hamdi of Egypt has raised a hand. Um, yeah, please, uh, would you uh, please uh, switch on your, your mic and camera? Uh, yeah, as to ask you a question. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Or good morning in New York. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very important and insightful presentation that uh, shed, uh, sheds important lights on, on uh, the great values of the, of the peaceful users in, in uh, of the nuclear energy, uh, I have I have a comment and a question. The first, uh, let's let me start first by my question is that uh, for any of the panelists, whether they can consider new ideas and initiatives that can be considered in the next review conference on how to uh, uh, make uh, um, the the resources for the technical cooperation more assured and sustainable and predictable. Bear in mind that uh, there is um, the, the, the financial uh, uh, availability of these resources uh, uh, has, has, has faced many, many challenges in the past years. And there are lots of uh, projects uh, that, has, uh, that have been agreed uh, by the agency uh, that have not been financed and, could, and there was no sufficient funds to uh, implement these projects. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point is a comment, uh, which has to do with the, 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 the nuclear-derived techniques. I, I think there is a need to caution against the, uh, uh, placing the, the nuclear-derived techniques on an equal footing with the nuclear techniques. Of course, the nuclear techniques, from my perspective, shall take the precedence uh, the nuclear techniques are the techniques where the nuclear component is the highest component of all other uh, industrial uh, components or technological components. However, the nuclear life techniques is just uh, only a small part of, of the technique is nuclear. So I think it is important when we address the peaceful users to uh, uh, accord the priority to the nuclear techniques mainly the nuclear techniques and of course also with, a, with, with, with an emphasis maybe on also the advanced peaceful users. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for your question. Um, very good. Do we have further questions? Otherwise, uh, and also in the interest of time, we'll, we'll turn back to the, to the panel. Um, and also, um, I think to our, our keynote speaker, if, if that's okay to answer that question on the coordination with the WHO on, on COVID. Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Ambassador. If I may come in, indeed, uh, as I stated in my presentation, this is an initiative that has uh, started by the IAEA uh, with the member states, and uh, we've also reached out to our uh, sister UN uh, organization, the WHO, uh, all our activities related to human health and uh, other health-related aspects, we always reach out to WHO. So we've had a conversation with them, and uh, immediately we start implementing uh, this project. Uh, we will be working very closely with the WHO. 
Equally, just maybe to add also, uh, you know, there is an element of the veterinary side as well. And we have done the same with uh, OIE and also FAO. These are very, very close partners that uh, we always uh, consult and work with um, here at the IEA. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for those uh, clarifications. Okay, then uh, that leaves us with the question, uh, which is actually a big question, on um, um, ideas for new initiatives on uh, sustainable financing. Uh, can I um, turn to the panelists um, uh, uh, in the same order that they spoke and ask them to very briefly respond? Um, and after that, I think we will have to close this session if, uh, with my eye on, on the clock. Um, Charles, can I ask you to, uh, to to answer that question first or to make any other remarks that you wish to maybe also in response to the other presentations? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Margaret. So, uh, I'll be very brief regarding the question raised by Mr. Hamdi of Egypt. Uh, firstly, I agree with him that uh, it is necessary for us to have new ideas uh, and fresh thinking that could help to widen the basket of funds available for the IEA uh, to make those funds sufficient, assured and predictable. Uh, and I believe that the discussions we are having in the lead up to the conference, including today's webinar and the others that preceded it and the others that would come after it, uh, could be slowly guiding us towards that direction. I am not sure that uh, anybody has the silver bullet immediately, but I think that for as long as we continue speaking with each other in the spirit of collaboration and we bearing in mind our shared vision, I am sure we would find the necessary uh, elements and building blocks to achieve sufficient assured and better funding for the IAEA Technical Cooperation Program. It is important to do so because the need continues to increase and the, the resources shouldn't remain the same. And it is even more important in view of the current global environment uh, related to COVID and its impact on economic resources of contributing states. It, it, it is not impossible that the funds that may be available in the years ahead may reduce so we have to think of new ideas and where industry can come in, I would say, to be very good. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oko, for, for those remarks. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Belbao Ilion, would you have um, an answer to the question or any other uh, remarks? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, well, I, I think that uh, specifically to the question of how to uh, get uh, access uh, for additional technical cooperation funds to the international atomic atomic energy agency is difficult for for us to 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 say but i will say one thing i will say uh, i think that uh, as part of of the key uh, achievements that we can get in the context of this third pillar of the mpt i think we need to ensure that um, multilateral development banks and multinational banks, import export banks, consider very seriously uh, nuclear science and technology as one of the one of the potential investments that they may want to make. I mean, as you know, in many cases, uh, nuclear uh, technology is specifically excluded from the, the technologies that are uh, supported by these development banks, which of course it is a problem when particularly developing countries are, are trying to use these technologies, are trying to develop their expertise. So, so I, would, I would strongly suggest that perhaps this is one of the areas where the, the signatories of the APT governments can work with these entities to ensure that that the criteria that are put in place to 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 decide what can or cannot be uh, uh, supported is technology neutral and science based and is actually looking into the actual impact that this these technologies can have on sustainability for the various countries. And with that, I thank you once again for the opportunity to join in and and this this team panel and and all of you. In 
in this in this in this event. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, uh, Sama, for for those recommendations and for your participation. Um, we we'll quickly turn to uh, uh, Dr. Babu. Would you have any a recommendation for us? Ambassador, I think I have two recommendations, uh, Ambassador, in terms of. Um, uh, the support uh, by the agency uh, and to these NGT applications, uh, this support should continue because there are two spread of um, success. It has been happened, say, uh, 20 years before when we started the harmonization of personal certifications of NDT, uh, the agency IAA played a greater role to the developing countries to set the certification of persons in NDT, especially in the radiographic testing. And that went fantastically well. And the second uh, uh, last 10 years into the civil and infrastructure applications, it's, it's uh, good cooperations. The countries in the Southeast Asia, and you could see the countries in South America has greatly benefited to the RCA and ARCAL um, uh, support. And that should continue. And I would say developing countries that played a crucial role like Japan and Australia, and United States have supported these uh, uh, growing countries of transferring the technologies and that went well. And the second part is uh, in terms of uh, ideas of um, fundings and support, I would say the nuclear energy is sometimes forgotten as this is a cleaner energy and uh, I would say it has to be taken the UN climate change uh, uh, financial support into the applications of um, um, the support to peaceful applications and energy demands. So this is something um, which could be deliberated, discussed and to have a long standing support, uh, especially for power applications and growing demand is there. And uh, this is one of the successful technology has been there for the last uh, five decades at least. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Um, finally, uh, Ms. Denjoy. Would you have any further recommendations? Yes, I'm sorry, I just uh, uh, forgot to, to unmute my micro. Um, oh. I would say, uh, yes, I believe uh, nuclear uh, technology is uh, very important, as you've seen in uh, health applications. And uh, it, is, um, uh, it is very important uh, that uh, governments, uh, in, especially in LMICs, you know, low and medium income countries, uh, consider those technologies uh, in order to save more lives uh, because uh, those technologies are um, uh, see, are uh, quite uh, well used in Europe or in the US or in developed countries. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, you know uh, LMICs, uh, this is not the case, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, people unfortunately do not benefit. Uh, uh, to those technologies. Uh, so the government should uh, put uh, better access to those technologies uh, um, and ensure also that uh, resources uh, are being uh, put uh, behind uh, those technologies as well. But uh, uh, you've seen uh, that uh, there are value added uh, in uh, using those uh, technologies in the healthcare sector. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for these remarks. Um, we're seeing that uh, we've already run uh, quite a bit over time, and I apologize uh, for that to everyone. Um, I don't want to keep you from your weekend if you are in a more Eastern time zone. Uh, but um, I thought it a very valuable engagement. Uh, it is very good to hear from industry and uh, to engage with them and to get that message across uh, that they have a very important role to play in the NPT context. Um, I want to thank um, all our speakers uh, for their presentations today, their contributions, um, as, uh, as well as, uh, as especially our, our keynote speaker and the Secretary, uh, Secretary General Nakamitsu and our closing speaker, President Desnick Selvinen, uh, for their contributions. It's much appreciated. 
And finally, again, a big thanks to you and ODA and the IAEA for organizing this and for putting this together. And with that, um, I would like to close the meeting, given the time. Uh, thanks also to all the participants for um, for your presentation, your presence and participation. And I'm looking forward to engaging with all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.